Okay. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, you are at the Rehoboth Beach Museum virtually for its conversations on history. Uh, this afternoon's program is History of Rosedale Beach, and it's going to be presented by uh, Tamara Banks. Many of you who got in here a little earlier could hear Tamara and I conversing, and then Nathaniel Hopkins and some of his memories. So you've had a little extra coming on. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed that also. Um, for the rest of the program, if you all would stay on mute, excuse me a minute, I'm letting some more people in. Um, if you would stay on mute and uh, so that we have a, a smooth, smooth program going on. And I am just really pleased to introduce today uh, Tamara Burks. Uh, she has been researching um, for years uh, this aspect of Delaware's African American history, Africa, uh, Delaware's music history in Sussex County, shall we say. Um, she is a uh, she was a journalism major at Delaware State. Um, she also has a master's degree from the New School of Social Research in New York City. And she's back in Delaware because she says she always comes back to Delaware. And I'm just so pleased to have her with us today. And of course, she has some uh, personal ties to Rosedale, which makes it even better, I think. So uh, not wanting to go on anymore tomorrow, I'm turning it over to you and we will be quiet. Okay, well, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. So I'm just gonna get started with my um, presentation. So hold on one second, bear with me. This is, this is, uh, okay, start, start broadcast. I'm just waiting for my slides to load here, everyone. Okay. A portrait of a Delaware cultural institution is um, how I've uh, titled my uh, presentation here. The wrong button, sorry. Over 25 years ago, my father, Leroy Jubilee, share some information with me that I did not know that was important, just not just for him or for me, but for the state of Delaware um, and possibly the nation. So this is me when I was a little girl and this is my dad. And um, he had a vision apparently for the future for me to um, maybe tell this story. So he decided to share the story with him, with me. And I want to tell you that my dad and I, we grew up in two different worlds, so to speak. Um, and I began attending Kent County of Delaware, um, Kent County schools in Delaware during the height of the busing era in the 1970s. So for me, some of my teachers were people of color, some were not. I was a member of the local YMCA where I swam with children of various backgrounds. I went to the roller rink on Friday night and Saturday night or whenever I could. I attended the, um, an integrated church where I had a little singing group. So this is me with my three best friends um, in church. Um, and I ate at Denny's or wherever my family chose to eat. I went to a local lake to swim. So we, li we lived in two different worlds. We weren't um, growing up with the same experiences. And then on a weekend um, trip going across the Bay Bridge, into the state of Maryland, my father actually started telling me about the story of Roselle Beach. There were no earphones, no iPods, no cell phones, et cetera. So I could not tune him out, even though I may have wanted to. So he had my full attention. And he told me that um, people of color had their own beaches and resorts um, where they could go swimming and have picnics. He also told me about a place in Millsboro called Rosedale Beach where famous entertainers would perform. 
Um, and I had been to Millsboro many times. I just could not believe it. I thought, where, where were these people performing? I couldn't believe it. But I never forgot those stories that he told me. And then many years later, I was working on a music history project. Um, and I started looking to, to look further into the history of Rosedale Beach. I began interviewing my dad. And because many of our early interviews um, took place in restaurants, most of my early notes were written on dinner napkins, believe it or not. Between the early 1800s to the 1900s, the Rosedale Beach Resort was once referred to as Harmon's Park and was owned by Isaac and Sarah Harmer, Harmon. And the Harmons were members of the Nanny Cook community in Millsboro. Um, Harmon's Park early on was a gathering place for amusements and leisure. The park was used for a variety of activities, including bathing, um, playing baseball, religious, religious meetings. Um, then it was known as Noah's Park, which was used for bathing, playing baseball, religious meetings, and was sold to David E. Street. So Rosedale Beach was already uh, a destination um, in Delaware for people of color. And this is Isaac and Sarah Harmon. Now, Isaac, I want to tell you about him. He was a, an amazing man. He had uh, various businesses. I also found that he was a banker. So he actually loaned money to people. So he, he was a, a great entrepreneur, a great visionary, an amazing man. 1935 was a, start, was a time of stark contrast. We were experiencing an ailing economy in every corner of America, but at the same time, people wanted to have a good time. So live entertainment became a luxury after the stock market crash. 20% of all Americans were on public assistance, which includes 50% of the people of color in Northern cities. In the South, the ailing economy caused several farmers and agricultural workers of color to lose their incomes, causing widespread homelessness. This was also at the same time when the music of people of color began to take on an urban identity and an air of professionalism. So this is just an image, several images of the, the Great Depression that didn't care what your color was or your background. Everybody, this is something everybody was dealing with. And this is, the, this is leading up to the opening of the, um, of the new Rosedale Beach. Hotel. This is an image of um, you know the music called the Black Music Renaissance, 1930s, with the hot jazz. So this is this is kind of people were going through um, various issues with their incomes, but they also wanted to have a good time. So this is kind of letting you know that you know despite all the odds, people still wanted to have fun. Now, um, this next slide, I'm going to actually take you to the early 1930s in Berwyn, Pennsylvania, where our Rosedale Beach story, our current Rosedale Beach story begins. So in Berwyn, Pennsylvania, between 1932 and 1934, there was what was called a school fight where at one point children of all backgrounds were attending school together in this town, and there was a decision made to segregate the schools by race. So also at this time, there was only one business owned by people of color there in Berlin, and that was a print shop. Now in 1935, um, Jesse and Joffrey Voss traveled to Rosedale Beach, Delaware from Berwyn, Pennsylvania for a holiday weekend. And apparently the bosses were people of distinction at this note, as this notice actually appeared in a society section of the Afro-American newspaper publication. So then in 1937, Jesse and Joffrey Voss purchased a parcel of land by deed in Millsboro from Delphius Miller Hopkins and her husband, Ernest Hopkins. And this deed was dated April 3rd, 1937. And eventually um, I came across the original incorporation documents that no one know existed. 
um, at the Division of Corporations. And this was the incorporation documents where the company was incorporated as the Rosedale Beach Inc. Um, April 14th, 1937, by Jesse Voss of Burn, Pennsylvania, Floyd Voss of Millsboro, um, Joffrey Voss of Millsboro. So this family, they were in business together, you know. And Jesse Voss actually at that time demolished a five-room hotel located on the um, the site that was already there to build the um, to to get and you know get ready for the new hotel and resort. So in 1946, um, Jesse Voss built the new Rosedale Beach Hotel, which had 32 rooms. And in 1955, Rosedale Beach Inc. was described as a summer resort with a hotel, restaurant, and a bar. And this is interesting because some of the, um, this gives us the names of some of the people that were on the board, including Dorsey Johnson, Warren Jackson of Millsboro, Harry C. Burton of Lewis, Delaware at the time, and the officers of the Rosedale Beach Inc. included President Benjamin B. Campbell of Millsboro, Vice President and Treasurer Jesse W. Voss, and Secretary Floyd Voss, which was his brother. Now, this is interesting because a lot of people, when I was doing research about Rosedale Beach, um, you couldn't find anything. I went to the archives, there was no information, but this lets us know this was a, a, an actual official incorporated company. They had a board, so they ran the hotel as a professional co corporation. And it's so amazing when I when I actually read the uh, certificate of incorporation documents, I was just floored by the uh, awesome vision and plans that the Boss family had for the resort. Um, so along with the hotel, the resort once featured a boardwalk, dance hall, picnic area, beachfront area, campground with cottages, an amusement park, and a baseball diamond. But also, some of the other intended purposes for the site were to include a hall for assemblies, lectures, musical programs, literary, social, and other entertainment. So they had a great vision. They also wanted to present scientific exhibits. They wanted to open a museum. And parts of the building were to be used as a library, a restaurant, and a cafe business. So these are, these are people who, had, like I said, had a great vision for this area and the site and the people there. This is one of the early cottages and, and um, there's an image here um, that was graciously uh, provided by Doris Price um, of Rosedale Beach Hotel. So this, this um, vehicle is very early. So you can just see, um, you know, there are very few images of the hotel. And this is the postcard here, but um, the hotel and resort operated from the early 1900s to the 1970s. Um, but because there were very few places for people of color to go for entertainment and hotel accommodations, people would travel to Rosedale Beach from points north, south, east, and west. Church groups, college students came, family groups, individuals would come to a little enclave like Millsboro to see some of the best entertainment anywhere at the time. And this is an image of the um, then and now image of the pavilion and the boat ramp that's there today. So if you go to the site today, you'll still see the same pavilion that um, many of the stars uh, would perform on, um, out on the water so that anybody who uh, sailed by or got close enough to the resort could hear and enjoy the music coming from the hotel. They had baseball games there. Um, so in the 1940s, there was a place for baseball games at Rosedale Beach. So you had local teams would play and crowds of people would come to watch the games. And apparently there were um, baseball players who were, you know, who could be in the major leagues that performed there. But because of their color or their, you know, they weren't able to do so. Church groups came to Rosedale Beach for Sunday picnics. So there was always something going on there. Buses from larger cities in the surrounding area would arrive at the resort and it became the hangout for college students who came to Rosedale Beach to participate in special activities. So Rosedale Beach was there for Lauderdale.
this is an original advertisement um, that was provided by Bobby Walls, who is one of the grandsons of the bosses. Um, so he sent me this uh, advertisement. And this lets you know, in case you weren't, you didn't believe it, they had daily buses coming from Philadelphia to Rosedale Beach. Um, you could rent a cottage, a cabin, hotel for the week. Um, they had meals that they provided there. So this was a, this was a very uh, important uh, corporation that was well put together and run very professionally. Now we'll get into some of the artists uh, that performed at Rosedale Beach. And I just put together this little ad showing Thomas Fats Waller, Louis Armstrong, Count Basie, James Brown, Cap Calloway, Ray Charles, Sam Cooke, just a few, Ella Fitzgerald, Jackie Wilson, Stevie Wonder. Here are just some more images. Thomas Fats Waller. And so now the resort, you know, of course, featured the best entertainment, but at the same time, the performers could also sleep now in the same hotel they performed in, which was different. It's Louis Armstrong. The Ink Spots, Chick Webb. So performers and their big bands such as Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Chick Webb performed for energetic Rosedale Beach crowds as well as Fats Baller and the Ink Spots. Now, when my dad told me that uh, Rosedale Beach was just a, you know, a very happening place, it was everybody performed there, it was a very uh, well-known area. I didn't really truly believe it until I came across this Billboard magazine, a Billboard advertisement um, from 1946 to 1950. And it says, Rosedale Beach famous show spot of Millsboro, Delaware has inaugurated Saturday night bar and dances for the winter for the first time in history. Now under the management of Floyd R. Voss, who represents owner Jesse Voss, the spot is located in good hunting territory. So this was a, this is a national magazine, you know, that featured, uh, these advertisements. They had one um, with Lucky Melinder, who ushered in the new season on the June 23rd of 1950. And it says Voss at his Rosedale Dancery at Billsboro, Delaware. So it was a, a very uh, popular place, very popular. And here we have um, the world famous Lionel Hampton and his orchestra performed at Rosedale Beach on Monday night, July 31st, 1944. Ella Fitzgerald entertains the troops. So Ella Fitzgerald entertained guests of the Rosedale Beach Hotel after many had returned home from World War II, including my grandfather. At this time, the resort included little private cottages with two rooms. Now this picture has nothing to do with the presentation. I just love it so much, so I stuck it in there. And we got Sam Cook, Fats Domino. Now Sam Cook would have probably been one of my favorite entertainers that would have performed at Rosedale Beach. And actually his um, signature song, A Change Is Gonna Come, became an inspirational theme song while working on my, um, my project, the, the Historic Marker Project. Cab Calloway. Jackie Wilson and Count Basie. A young Aretha Franklin. Ray Charles and a young Stevie Wonder. Now this uh, next slide brings us to a very um, volatile time in America. And this is actually the 60th anniversary of the Freedom Rides, 2021. And Rosedale Beach continued to stay in operation through these times. So we were fighting for equality on public transportation and schools um, and in public facilities.
Now, my dad told me the story about um, how James Brown stopped the near riot from breaking out in Millsboro. He said James Brown was set to perform at Rosedale Beach to sold out audiences when James Brown was a no-show. He was actually stopped by the Delaware State Police on the highway. As people shouted, we want James Brown, we want James Brown. He came around the corner and the crowd went wild. So as I said, Rosedale Beach, you know, continue to be in operation, you know, during these, these volatile times. And, uh, but during the 1960s, James Brown, Jackie Wilson and young Stevie Wonder performed at Rosedale. So the Freedom Rise actually ushered in the end of an era of segregation in public facilities, but also many venues like the one at Rosedale Beach and, um, became a thing of the past. So when people were presented with uh, more choices for leisure and activities, uh, visitation would actually start to go down at Rosedale Beach and other similar resorts. And this is actually an original tax report from 1954, just to um, give you an idea of um, where they actually were referred to as a summer resort and hotel. So this is actually a little Rosedale Beach timeline from the 1950s to the 1960s. So in 1955, Rosedale Beach was described as a summer resort with a hotel, restaurant, and bar. Um, the board of directors included Dorsey Johnson, Warren Jackson, Harry C. Burton, Jesse Voss, and his brother Floyd, um, treasurer and secretary. And in 1961, the lands of the Vosses which totaled about nine acres in total, was sold to board members, um, board member Harry C. Burton and Danelle de Burton. Here's another timeline from the 1970s to the 1980s. Give you an idea of what happened. A lot of people want to know, you know, what happened with the uh, resort. So in 1962, the, the Rosedale Beach Boardwalk was destroyed. In 1963, an agreement was signed with the state of Delaware to allow visitors to park their cars on Rosedale Beach property. So this is sort of a beginning of, of the property not being as private or as, you know, having less control over it, because now you have the state of Delaware um, uh, agreement set up. And in 1976, the Rosedale Hotel Bar was still open for business. On Sundays, people came to Rosedale Beach and local bands were hired to play at the hotel weekly. And in 1981, an agreement of purchase and sale was made between Rosedale Beach Development Corporation and the owners of the Rosedale Beach Hotel, which would be the Burtons. And then the new Rosedale Beach um, Inc. entered into an agreement with the state of Delaware's um, Department of Natural Resources to build a boat ramp. So that boat ramp, image I showed earlier is, you know, that's what there was. And so if you want to sell the property, you also have that agreement that's added into that, um, that deed. And in 1983, an assignment of title and interest was transferred to Gold Point Incorporated that is located there today, the Gold Point community. So um, in doing research, there was very little information um, about Rosa Beach when I started doing research. And there were some things that I wanted to know before getting started. I wanted to know why in the world were the bosses going to come to Millsboro to operate a resort? And then I also wanted to know how rare the Rosedale Beach Resort in Amer was in America before the 1960s. So some of the things I found was that there were few opportunities in Berwyn, Pennsylvania for the bosses at the time. As I said, there was one business owned by people of color there. And they caught a dream when they visited Rosedale Beach a few years before and jumped at the chance to follow their dreams. And even in the midst of a depression, people still wanted to have a good time. Now, next I wanna present you with a, a sampling of rare resorts owned by people of color before the 1960s. And there are, there are numerous ones. These are just a sample. Um, and I wanted to know 
how rare Rosedale Beach was and based on the scale on the where they operated, bringing in people, entertainment, and publicity from a variety of places, they were very rare. But I'll start with um, Bruce's Beach. I don't know if you all have heard about Bruce's Beach in the news here recently. They operated from the early 1900s to 1927. And the Bruce's Beach was actually opened in Southern California in the early 1900s by entrepreneurs, Charles and Willa Bruce. I will tell you that Willa Bruce owned the resort and her husband assisted her in the business. So Bruce's Beach included an inn called Bruce's Lodge, a cafe, a dance hall, and a two block private residential community. And this area was actually located not too far down from Venice Beach. This is the prime real estate worth probably billions of dollars today. Um, the patrons were racially harassed by the surrounding community. Their tires were slashed when they went to visit the beach and the beach was actually taken away from the Bruce's by the city. But on September 30th of 2021 this year, the land was rightfully returned to the descendants of the Bruce's. So they actually got their beach back this year after many years of fighting. This is an amazing, beautiful images of the of image of the Bruce's. So this is Willa and her husband, Bruce, um, Charles. These are just some images from Bruce's Beach. They have a memorial that's actually set up. So if you go out to, you also might know the area as Manhattan Beach. So if you go there today, you'll see these, um, this memorial. And this is an image from the 1970s. From the Afros, you can tell it's from the 1970s. Okay, so this next um, beach is Highland Beach, um, 1893. It was actually founded in the Chesapeake Bay, um, Maryland area after patrons of color had been turned away from the restaurants at the nearby Bay Bridge Resort. So the resort was incorporated in 1922 and was visited by noted individuals such as Paul Robeson, Mary Church Terrell, Booker T. Washington, Alex Haley, Langston Hughes, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And these are just some images um, of Highland Beach incorporated in 1922. It looked like they're having a good time. And this is just a map um, showing where the beach um, was located. Today, um, Boca Harbor, Bell Mirara, and a Caribbean Key area. Next, um, Peg Lake Bates Resort operated from 1951 to 1989. Peg Leg Bates and his wife created one of the few resorts and country clubs for people of color in 1951 in Concha Hawken, upstate New York. Um, they converted a large turkey farm into Catskills, into, in the Catskills Mountain into a resort. And I've been to the Catskills and it's one of the most beautiful places in America. Um, it became one of the largest black owned operated and operated resorts in the country. And Peg Leg Bates would actually entertain the audiences in the shows he promoted in his own nightclub. And he would actually greet all the guests as they arrived. And the resort featured hundreds and hundreds of jazz musicians and dancers. The best of the best entertainment there as well. And here's an ad that I found um, of advertising his interracial country club. They had a, where you could get a, have the guest house, they had a main house, bungalow, cottages, swimming pool, lawn games, basketball they provided, baseball, dancing. And this is a, a nice uh, view of the Catskills area um, where the resort was located. The next resort is Lincoln Hills um, that was operating between 1928 and 1964, located in um, Gilpin County, Denver, Colorado, was one of the handful of places in America where people of color could rent or purchase a vacation home or cabin. And um, some of the visitors you might be familiar with, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. writer, Lena Horn, performer, Count Basie, performer, Duke Ellington, Langston Hughes, um, writer. 
And the resort actually advertised in Ebony and Jet magazines. So you could find out about, um, you know, where to go, what to do from through Ebony and Jet. And this is a, one of their advertisements that they put out, a huge advertisement. Some more pictures of Lincoln Hills. Oh, sorry. It's another image from Lincoln Hill. Um, some of their guests. This is also Lincoln Hills. And this is actually, I put this in here because this is a, a modern resort, um, Salamander Resort and Spa um, owned by Sheila Johnson or started by Sheila Johnson, who's a former um, BET founder. Just to kind of give you an idea of you know, how they've developed today and maybe some of those resorts might've been uh, looking like this today had they continued on. Remembering Rosedale Beach. So one of the um, areas people are always, always interested in, they wanna know what led up to the Rosedale Beach historic marker. It's not an easy process, I will tell you. Um, but my, my process actually started uh, by, hap I call it a happenstance because uh, everything that led up to it, you know, was just, was just an amazing, it's an amazing story, put it that way. I had a conversation with Dr. Michael Blakey, um, who was the scientific director of the New York African Burial Ground Project, which I worked at as a historical researcher. Um, and he actually had a paper that was in the office um, and he was describing the history of the Nanny Coke people um, there. And so I, I was very interested in the stories and he grew up there in Delaware. And so when I read his story, I kind of kind of triggered me to remember some of the stories my father had told me. And then in 2009, I was working on a program ideas for the Delaware State Museums and I started to look further into the history of Rosedale Beach. And due to budget cuts, um, I began working at the Delaware Division of Corporations uh, where I actually found the original Rosedale Beach Inc. Incorporation document. So hadn't I I would say, I won't say lost my job because what they did was they had me working at the museum and also working at the corporation at the same time. But had that situation happened, I probably would have never found these documents. So I will say, you know, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> so between 2009 and 2010, um, the research was completed and was presented to the Delaware Public Archives and the marker was approved. So this is an image of me when I was working in New York, um, right before the Twin Towers went down because I worked at the World Trade Center. I was on my way to work that day. I was uh, expecting my youngest daughter and my two-year-old daughter, who uh, you'll see a picture of them later. She didn't want to get dressed that day. So uh, that's why I didn't make it because I had to be here with you all today telling this story. And this is a picture, an image of Dr. Michael Blakey he was the one who got me thinking, my wheels are turning about Rosedale Beach. This is 2001. And this is my, uh, my ID from the World Trade Center there on the bottom left corner. And um, it's an image of some of the uh, workers that I work with. This was the New York African Burial Project. Now, one of the um, other stories that I actually talk about, but that I am, completely involved in is the story of Elders Reed Johnson, who actually, his family was from Sussex County. And he actually grew up here in Dover and he has a museum where I was working at on one of those music projects. And um, this little boy, when he was a little boy, grew up in Dover, he was told he was too stupid to go to college. So, and I actually think he was too smart to go to college because he ended up starting the Victor Talking Company in Camden, New Jersey. So you might be familiar with the Nipper Dog and the Victor Talking Company. They sold their business to RCA, which then became Sony. So this little boy who wasn't smart enough to go to college actually sold his business in, in about 1929 before the stock market crash to uh, RCA for $29 million. Now, some of his earliest artists 
were um, people of color. So you got um, Burt Williams, William A. Carlisle, Duke Ellington, Thomas Fats Waller, Jelly Roll Morton, Paul Robeson, and Marion Anderson. Now, if you want to visit his um, Memorial Museum, you can come right to Dover, Delaware. You look it up online because you can actually see his museum um, where the, his son wanted to put his museum right in Dover where he grew up. And so it's because of his museum and his you know, amazing story that got me interested in, in um, looking further into the history of Rosedale Beach. And I started doing, um, let's see. Oh, my apologies. I started doing presentations um, at the museum. So this is me, an early picture of me. I don't look anything like that now, but I was uh, doing presentations with the Victrola. So I was heavily into the stories. Okay. All right, let me get to the next slide here. All right. Now, the next slide takes us into um, the story of Delaware Public Archives and the process as I spoke about before about getting the marker, doing the research, you had to secure the funding. We also had to go to Gull Point and get permission to put the marker up. But I will tell you the Gull Point community were so amazing. They were so appreciative, so interested in getting this marker up. They said, yes, yes, they had a meeting. Um, I mean, nothing but love from the Gold Point community even today. Um, matter of fact, we're working on a documentary with the Delaware State Parks on Rosedale Beach and they allowed us to come down and, and film there as well. And so then we had to plan a marker unveiling uh, ceremony. And I thought, okay, we're gonna do a marker unveiling ceremony. So who's gonna speak? So I started calling all these people and, you know, this one and that one, and no, nobody was available. And they said, well, Tamara, you, you're the one that did the research. You speak. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> I've never done anything like that. But, you know, I guess you could do anything you put your mind to. So this is between 2009 and 2011. I also began to write letters. Um, once the marker was approved, it was sent over to the Delaware State Legislature. And then I began a campaign of... Um, sending out letters to legislators and community groups. And this letter actually went to the um, William C. Jason Alumni Association. And I wanted to try to get their, their, um, their backing on trying to get the marker. So I told them a little story and this is my letter to them. One of my letters, actually this letter, this actual letter went to Representative John C. Atkin, my apologies. But I did send a letter also to the William C. Jason Alumni Association or the Delaware State um, Sussex County um, Association also, Alumni Association. Now, one of the things I found when doing my research um, that these markers were actually mandated by Title 29 of the um, Delaware Code regarding state archives and historic objects. So the marker, this marker will fall, fell under the Senate Bill number 186, which established a freedom trail, which identifies important sites as evidence of the struggle of freedom or sla over slavery and segregation and other forms of injustice. So once I found this out, I said, wait a minute, we got to put this marker up. So I, that's, that's important when you do research, look at the law and see what the law um, provides for. This is a letter that went to um, my um, representative in Kent County at the time, which was uh, uh, Bradford Bennett. And he was uh, very uh, instrumental in, you know, helping to uh, get the funding approved as well, as far as you know, giving his opinion on it. And he actually wrote me a letter um, telling me that he thought that the project would be of national importance and he really wanted to support the project. So I, I just had so much, um, so much support um, from these, these senators and representatives. Now this is uh, Senator George Bunting of Bethany Beach. Um, I actually spoke to him on the phone, uh, which I couldn't believe that, but he told me an amazing story about how his, his mother used to go down and listen to the music at Rosedale Beach. So he was, um, he was a key member along with John, Representative John Atkins of Millsboro. They actually put the funding available together for the marker. 
And initially there was no money. There was no money, but this, this marker wanted to be put up, the story wanted to be told, so there was nothing that was stopping it. Working with Gull Point, um, I contacted the Gull Point Homeowners Association and received an extremely positive response, which I said earlier. I worked together with, along with Tom Summers at the Public Archives to decide where the marker would go and be placed. And initially, um, we had to actually take the project all the way up to the um, uh, one of the offices in the state of Delaware um, to approve it because I guess because of the boat ramp. So they had to, to go and um, get that approved. Um, and then we planned with the association's assistance, a marker ceremony. There were numerous articles and uh, advertisements or articles in the Delaware State News and all, all sorts of newspapers um, about the history because so many people, this is a people's history. So everybody's interested, a lot of people are interested in it. So we have various articles that were um, written about it. Now this is the um, historic marker proof. So we wrote up the, um, the marker uh, information or the information that would go on the marker that was approved. And they put together a proof. So this is actually the marker proof um, that was put together and then we approved it and made sure we dotted all our T's or dot all our I's and cross our T's. And this is actually the marker, which I will um, read in case you haven't had a chance to go down and see it, um, it's up today. So on this site was located the Rosedale Beach Hotel and Resort. The hotel and resort operated from the early 1900s to the 1970s. In the pre-integration era of the 20th century, there were very few places for people of color to go for entertainment and hotel accommodations. And because of this, Rosedale Beach was a destination point for many people along the East Coast. Rosedale Beach was officially incorporated on April 14, 1937. The resort featured a hotel, boardwalk, dance hall, picnic area, beachfront area, campground, and amusement park. Well-known artists such as Louis, Louis Armstrong, Count Basie, James Brown, Cap Calloway, Ray Charles, Sam Cooke, Bats Domino, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, Aretha Franklin, Jackie Wilson, C.B. Wonder, and many, many more actually played at the resort. Um, once Delaware integrated its beaches, hotels, and other public facilities, visitation to Rosedale Beach began to decline. So the boardwalk was destroyed by the storm of 1962 and was never replaced, actually. So although people were still visiting the resort until the mid 1970s, the resort beach hotel and resort was eventually sold to Gulf Point, Inc. in 1983. So we had a marker dedication ceremony on December 2nd, 2011, which was 10 years ago. So December 2nd, 2001 marked our 10 year anniversary. And these are just some images um, from the marker ceremony. This is me, nervous, trying to, trying to get myself together to speak um, at this marker ceremony. And this was, um, was my husband, um, Khalil Shaw, who actually has passed away since then. And this is another image of us getting ready to unveil the marker. And this um, young gentleman to the left is actually from the public archives. This is my daughter, my youngest daughter, Kenisa Shaw. Um, she was reciting her grandfather, Leroy Jubilee's Rosedale Beach story. It's an image of Senator George Bunting who came to the marker ceremony. And I'm just, I'm like a kid in the candy store. I'm so excited to hear their stories. And this is um, Mr. Bill Daisy, who unfortunately just passed away a few days ago. He was very instrumental in, in helping me to, giving me the support that I needed to go, go through with the project. Um, I spoke with him on the phone several occasions and uh, he was actually set to be interviewed for our documentary that we we're working on, but unfortunately he passed away you know, before that could be done. This is um, Bobby Walls. Um, one of the grandsons of the Vosses. And actually it's funny because I found Bobby Walls through his brother, um, what's the brother's name? Albi Walls, who was actually living in Ghana at the time. And so I, I sent him an email and he emailed me back. How did you find me in Ghana? 
but I was a research, I have a background in um, you know journalism. So I was dig, I had to dig them out, but I finally found him and he actually came to the ceremony to speak. This is um, Mr. Tom Shannon, who is a former um, Delaware State trooper. And he got up and told a story about how um, when he was younger, um, he was sent down to Rosedale Beach on a raid. And he said that um, once he got inside the hotel, all he saw were people sitting down and having a good time. So he said, I just sat down and had a good time myself. And this is um, Doris Price, artist, resident of the Millsboro area. And she, and she was very instrumental in um, allowing me to use some of the very rare images um, of Rosedale Beach. She also um, has, is related to um, some of the former owners of Rosedale Beach. So she's got her own um, amazing story that she tells. She, she puts together these amazing um, pieces of artwork about Rosedale Beach as well. And she has a website, I'm not sure, um, I'm still active, but it's the freejazzbook.com um, that you can still see some of the artwork and the information. And here's some more pictures, Bill Daisy and um, Doris Price. And these are my daughters, um, Kalila and Kesa Shaw. And Kalila was the one that um, didn't want to get dressed that day when I was on my way to the World Trade Center. This is me and my dad, um, Leroy Jubilee. So it's because of him that I'm here today telling you this story. Hadn't he uh, had the, the idea and the vision to tell me the story, you know, we might not have had a marker today. This is Veronica Randolin who was the Gulf Point um, property manager at the time. And she was the one that I worked with um, tirelessly um, to get the marker approved and to the placement of the marker. So, so, the, so she was the one I worked with on that. More images. The image of you know, me, my dad, and the whole family there. And this is an image you know, with uh, Bobby and his three daughters. And the one in the front with the little pink coat on her name is Joffrey. So she's named after her uh, great grandmother. And I like to um, dedicate this presentation to the memory of those power couples, Isaac Harmon, Jesse and Joffrey Voss and Donelda and Harry Burton who had the vision for this former great American cultural institution called Rosedale Beach. And for all those many family members, individuals, politicians, state of Delaware officials, members of the press, WBOC television station, and the list goes on of who made it possible for us to keep the memory of Rosedale Beach alive for future generations to come. I would also like to extend a very special and heartfelt thank you to the Rosedale Beach Museum family, including museum director, Nancy Alexander, and Marge LaFord, LaFond, program manager, and for presenting this program and for inviting me to speak on one of my favorite subjects. I was very humbled and honored by the invitation. And that's the end of my presentation. Well, Tamara, thank you so, so much. Uh, we have some questions in the chat box. I don't know if you can see the chat box, but um, not sure where it would be. Well, oh, it's, it's, if you go to see you, are you? Okay, yeah, I do. You I do? do okay, you, you have it. So you can see it. So why don't you just go ahead and. Okay. You said that. Um, one of the questions is, you said the Highland Beach Resort was in Maryland, Southeast Annapolis, but the map you presented showed Highland Beach north of Boca Raton of Florida, which is correct. It was in Maryland. That, that might have been an error. And the next question is um, from Bonnie Hall. Um, is the marker being repaired or replaced? I drove the marker location this week and it's not there. Actually, it's back. It came back a couple days ago. 
I think on the anniversary of the 10 year anniversary, they replaced it. And, and another one, he was being laid to rest today. It must be talking about Mr. Bill Daisy. Yeah. Bless his soul. Next question or, or comment from Rose Grimson. And it says, Tamara, would you say that there are a few or a lot of people currently in the area who went to who want to remember Roselle, remember stories of the family members going to Roselle Beach in his heyday? There seem to be a lot. I'm coming across people every day. You know, um, there are a lot of stories out there. A lot of people who have memories, you know. And the important thing is, is that trying to uh, collect those memories, which is something that I don't know if the museum would be interested in doing a, a, a um, oral history project because there's so many stories that if you all have stories and the, the museum you know, is interested, please put together those stories because they're, they're lost when someone passes away. Like I said, we were gonna interview um, Mr. Bill Daisy and he passed away before we can get his story, you know, on tape there. Next question, um, Sandy Smith. Tamara, did you research Roselle Beach being listed in the Green Book? And yes, I'm, that's a good question. You know, I had never heard of the Green Book before I actually started working on um, uh, this documentary I'm working on. Because see, in my family, in my community, we knew about the Chitlin Circuit, which was a word of mouth network. So we didn't, we didn't have the Green Book. Even my father didn't know what the Green Book was. So I didn't know what the Green Book was. But I did actually come across, um, and I think it was 1953, we have a, a copy that was sent to us or a photocopy of the actual book from a museum in, or the archives in Cincinnati, Ohio. That they actually had a copy of uh, the Green Book and in that Green Book uh, 1953 uh, uh, publication, there's an advertisement for Rosedale Beach. So we're actually gonna put that in the documentary. Next is uh, from Kay Hubbard. This is great. Thank you for the information and sharing your process. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, let's see, next question or comment from Denny Brittenham. Hi, this is Denny Brittenham. How can someone get in touch with you? We'd love to invite you to do a presentation. Um, you can get in touch with Miss Marge Lafon, I believe. Yes. She can yes. Um, give you contact information. No problem at all. Next one, uh, Barbara Slavin. Um, I was on the original board of the Cap Calloway School in Wilmington and met Cap at the opening. Yes, and it's so amazing that Cap Calloway had a school. There was Delaware. We were an amazing place. We <laughs> have a lot of history that people just the little little Delaware. But yes, Cal Calloway School was there. Um, that's amazing, wow. Next is um, from Wayne Paskins. One of my new found friends, she says, thank you, great job. Um, let's see, the next one is, uh, I went inside the hotel, this is from Caroline Thompson. I went inside the hotel before demolition. demolition. The guest book was still on the desk. Oh my goodness, I truly hope someone did. Um, I was going to, but didn't. And you know, what we, what I would like to see is, uh, does anyone have any actual photographs from the museum? I know there, I've seen a few. I had a, actually one of the members of the Gold Point community um, did show me a couple, a couple of things. And, but it seems to me that there would be more images out there somewhere, but I don't know. I guess we'll have to see. And next we have um, Darlene Sellers. Thank you for the work you did in sharing this information and wonderful story. It was my pleasure. As I said before, this is my favorite subject. Um, I could talk on and on about it. Next is uh, from Sue Claire Harper. I am delighted to have had the opportunity to hear your presentation and view your terrific visuals. Extremely well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much for all the time and energy you have invested in bringing the important history of Roselle Beach to life. It's my pleasure. Uh, let's see. Couple other individuals. There's a, a beautiful um, comment from Caroline Thompson. Awesome presentation. Thank you for your work and presentation from Rose Grimson, Caroline Thompson. Let's see. And this is a good question. What surprised you the most while doing your research? That would have to be when I came across those advertisements in the um, in the Billboard magazine. Because you know, I think of Billboard. That's something. That's a magazine that we. That's amazing today. Anybody, the best of the best entertainers, 
and artists are in that magazine. So when I saw those advertisements in the Billboard magazine, I said, this is legitimate. This is a, this was an amazing place. I believed it. I believed it. Um, next is um, Tamara, I would love a copy of the picture of Chief Daisy, Doris Price, and Sylvia Pickett. Okay, let's, let's do that. I can um, look into that. Now, the, some of the images from that presentation that I have, um, I'm not exactly sure who took those pictures, but I'll be more than happy to share, to share it with you. Um, let's see what we got here from Susan Lee. Thanks, Tamara, very important. Keep up the good work. Let's see. Thank you so much. Georgia Bertage presentation from Judy Parkins. I think that's the last one. I think that is true. Um, oh, here's one from Caroline Thompson again. She's saying she loves Sussex County history. I do too. I'm 57. I wish I was there back then. That's the same thing my young daughter said. She, she, when I told her about Rosa, she said, can we go and visit there? <laughs> I had to break it. I had to break it to her that it's not there anymore. She got so upset. Yeah, it's really, it's really a shame. Um, here's another one from Janelle. Here it is. Can you see that? Yeah, Janelle Starling. It says, my husband, James Starling, has shared so much with me about Rosedale Beach. I was younger and not allowed to attend. Look what I missed. Great job. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, my dad told me that he was younger and couldn't attend either. But he said, he told me a story about how he used to go to the back door and he would, the door was open. He had his little fake guitar. He would play his guitar at the back door, you know. <laughs> but then my grandmother would go and shoot him away. Get on back home, you know, because she, she knew that it was not, not a place for little people. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard stories from a few people about how they used to drive. They were, they were underage, you know. Yes. And they would yes. drive on the other side of the water and park their cars and listen to the music from that. Yeah. Side. Yeah, people, that's why I said people always found a way, no matter who you were, how old you were, people always found a way to enjoy the music down yeah. in Rosedale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I want to, I, I just, I'm so pleased that we got such a good uh, response to everyone coming to this presentation. I personally enjoyed it very, very much, Tamara. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with Tamara, if they email, uh, program at rehobothbeachmuseum.org. I will pass the information along to Tamara. Is that okay with you, Tamara? Oh, yeah, sure. sure. And that way, um, you know, people can get to you. Um, and uh, if, unless anyone else has, has something they wanted to say, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself now and just Give everybody, give Tamara a hand clap if you like. And I do have one more thing I want to say is that there is an ebook or a, a hard copy of the historical uh, presentation that I do or the, the first research that I did. So if anyone's interested in that, they can um, let Marge know because um, I can make that available to you as well. Yeah. And we've also, um, we have recorded this, this meeting so that, and I will probably within a week or so, I will have it up on our website. If anybody wants to review it or if someone missed it and you can tell them they can go to our website and see it. Um, the other thing is that we hope uh, next spring when the weather has turned and the uh, pandemic has disappeared, et cetera, et cetera, that um, we're gonna have tomorrow back. And, and maybe that would be a time when we could also invite people to come yeah. and share their stories and, uh, and record that and have that little bit more of oral history. So again, without further ado, I'm gonna say goodbye to you all. And tomorrow, thank you so much. Yay. Bye, Fabulous, fabulous. Fabulous, fabulous, great, great show. Great job. Great presentation. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting off. Just let me take some. Okay.
Yes, Linda. Hi, Marge. Can you give me that email address again? Yes, it's uh, Rehoboth Beach Museum dot org. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the website. Just it's program at Rehoboth Beach. I'm actually going to type it in here. Okay. Uh, in the chat. Yeah. But it's program at Rehoboth Beach Museum. <coughs> there we go. Okay. Can you see that, Denise? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, good. Thank you. Good. Surely, surely. Okay. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Much love. Tomorrow, I'll be speaking to you, but thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful Bye. job. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. And Mr. Hopkins? Yes. I will be in touch with you. Oh, anytime. Some spring. Okay. <laughs> feel, feel free. Anytime. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's some All tremendous right. stories about Rosedale Beach. We were talking about it before your presentation earlier this week. Yes. Nick, this is Kester Cross. I saw you there. Hey, Kester. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, I, I want I'm to sorry, just say buddy. I attended a James Brown concert at Rosedale in the early 60s with Frank Olivas and all the Jason graduates. So this was a great presentation, I liked it. Also, yeah. um, Ms. Burks, you didn't mention Cars Beach and Sparrows Beach. Those were two beaches, I think they were run by two black sisters outside of the DC, Washington area. Yep. Yeah, there were many. I just gave a, a, just a sampling. I know there's so many. Great yeah. presentation, thank you so yeah. much. Hey, Earl. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I see you, Merv. How you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm changing the name of it. <laughs> oh. So that's when he becomes Merv, old that's old Jubilee's daughter. Yes, yes. Yeah, we all went to Jubilee. Yes. Yeah, we all went to Jason together, terribly. Tomorrow. Wow, wow. Great time. Yeah. Yeah, got a chance to see one of my dad's report cards from Jason. It was pretty good. Oh, yeah. Pretty it good. was? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah it was pretty good. <laughs> what year with Tamara, what year did your grad, dad graduate from Jason? I don't know. I have to ask I him. think it was 61, wasn't it? I think he was in my sister's class. Hmm. I have to ask him. 60, 61. Let's see. 63. 63? My class was 63. Yeah, you were 63. We were 65. Okay. Yeah. We live. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that was our slogan, right, Reverend? That's right. <laughs> well, it was.